Hello everyone, in this video I'm gonna talk about compression springs, about the stress in them, the strength of them, and uh, whether under the force they would uh, break or not, whether they would buckle, right, and bend from the uh, side or not, and also talk about how to find the spring constant that you have seen a lot in statics and dynamics and all those courses, so uh, you learn that it depends on the geometry of the part and the material. So how do you find the spring constant for a specific material and geometry? So let's get started. So here is a compression spring that is under the load F. The small d is the diameter of the wire and capital D is the um, mean diameter of the loops. And uh, if you cut the material of the spring, at one of these wires and you look at the cross section here you can see that there are uh, two things on that cross section one is the force that is tangent to the cross section and it causes a shear stress so you need to divide that force by the cross section and that is this guy here and also that force since it's applied off center compared to this cross section right you see there is some offset which is d over 2 then that force times d over 2 is going to cause a, a torque and that torque is going to cause a, a torsion and you know that the torsion stress is tr over j which is this one so if we find the maximum value of this we can get what tau max the maximum shear stress now so in this formula we replace the torque for f d over 2 as we just saw for uh, in order to find the maximum uh, shear stress we need to have the radius at maximum which is d over 2 the uh, polar moment of inertia is pi d to the 4 over 32 and the cross section is of course pi d squared over 4 if you plug in everything in here this is going to be the maximum stress in any cross section of the spring now here we're going to rearrange this formula and we're going to write it like this ks a, a parameter ks times 8 fd over pi d cubed and this ks by the way is 2c plus 1 over 2c where c itself is the ratio of diameter of the spring over diameter of the wire now this c has a specific name in a spring we call it the spring index so d cap d over small d again diameter of the loop over diameter of the wire we call it spring index and uh, then 2c plus 1 over 2c we call it ks when we call it shear stress correction factor which you can see in the maximum stress formula so if you look at the maximum stress formula, it tells you some interesting stuff. What are these stuff? Well, first, it tells you that the bigger the force, the bigger the stress, which is obvious. It tells you that the bigger the diameter is, so the wider the loops are, of course, you're going to have more stress. And of course, that's obvious because this uh, torque, the torsion is going to be bigger. It tells you that the thicker the material is, the smaller the stress, of course, because the cross section is going to be smaller, the, the bigger, and the J is going to be bigger, so the stress is going to go down, and this value of C, which is important, okay? In general, the C is something that you typically choose a range for it. Uh, so you're not going to choose the C very small or very large. Why? If the C is very small, what does it mean? It means that basically uh, the, the diameter of the spool, the wire is quite a bit thick compared to diameter of the loops. What does it mean? It means you are uh, winding a very thick material over a small radius, okay? So the spring is gonna be small but this material, let me use a different uh, maybe weight, so here, but, right, but this um, spring itself does not have a big diameter, and winding that thick of a spool over that small of a radius is not easy, and it causes a lot of stress.
So in general, you don't want a very uh, tiny spring with huge wires. That is what, that's when C is small. On the other hand, when C is big, that means the diameter of the loops are big compared to what? Diameter of the spring. So here the spool is um, thin, it's uh, narrow in terms of diameter, small, but the diameter of the loop is big, so you have something like this. Okay, and when that happens, the spring is going to be flimsy, it's not going to be strong, and it cannot carry much of a load, and it's going to buckle easily. So you don't want that kind of a spring or this kind of a spring. You want something that has a reasonable trade-off between cap D and small D, okay? So the C is typically, you choose a range for it. And if you ask me then what kind of typical value is a good value for the spring constant, then I would say uh, most of the um, springs are, the C for them is something like between 8 to 10. Okay, although there are springs with C of like five or so, like in clutches. But in general, the C, a normal typical C is something like eight, nine, ten, something like that. And it doesn't have to necessarily be an integer number, but that's a typical range for the spring constant. So anyways, this is the maximum stress in the spring. And now this stress, of course, should not exceed the strength of the material otherwise the part is going to what is going to fail so the question is how do i find the strength of the wire for the or the material the spool that is used for the spring and uh, the strength for the springs is not just uh, simply going and reading the number directly from a, a chart right there is a formula for that, and you might say, what is it? So the ultimate strength for a, a wire for springs is uh, going to be, according to this formula, SUT is equal to A over D to the M, where A and M are some constants that depends on the material and the geometry and D is the diameter of the spool, of course. And you might say, well, where does where do I get A and M? Here is an A and M table that you can see depending on which wire you use. So if it's made of music wire, made of like hand-drawn wire, made of chrome silicon wire, phosphor bronze wire, and so on and so forth, then you have a column of A, right, as you can see, and there is a column of M. So this is M. And depending on which unit you are working with, KPSI or megapascal, then you have either this column or what? This column. So you get the uh, power M and you get the numerator A. So once you decide which material to choose for the spring and you decided on your diameter of the spool, you can find what? The ultimate strength. Now, this ultimate strength is for tension or compression. This is for normal stress not for shear stress you know for shear stress we have to compare that tau against what about the maximum uh, allowable shear stress ssy and the ssy we typically in many applications we consider it to be half of sut for spring design we consider it anywhere between 0.35 to 0.50 to again which one of these it depends on the material so depending on which material is used in the design, uh, some of these ranges could be used. And you can find it in handbooks or in like the book by Shigley, which is my reference here. But if you want to be very conservative, you choose this very lower range. Or if you want to you, uh, use more of your material and take a little bit more risk, you want to take this one. Anyways, you make sure that your safety factor that you use is equal to what is equal to this maximum shear stress over what over the tau max. And from there, you can basically get your safety factor or you have your safety factor. And uh, based on the material that you choose, you design your um your spring. Remember, when you design a spring, there are some parameters that are unknown, and two of the most important ones are D and D.
Okay, these are two of the most important things, but there is more than that also. There is this pitch, right? And of course, the total length of the spring L. Or instead of L, you might say the number of loops, the number of coils, N, or uh, you might call them active uh, loop, uh, coils. So there are several parameters that you have to choose. And in general, there are several things that you need to consider. One is that you have a reasonable safety factor, which comes from the handbooks for application that you have, right? So each application where the spring is used has its own safety factor ranges, which you can find from the handbooks. So that is one of the constraints that you have. The next thing is, um, let me go to here and then I come back, is a stability against buckling. So not only when you push a, a compression spring too hard, you might break it, also, it can bend from the side and it can buckle. And this gives you a limit on the total length of the spring, okay? The unstretched length or uncompressed length of the spring, L0, which I mentioned up here, right? This guy. So uh, how much of length is going to guarantee that this guy is not going to buckle and going to stay stable under compression? The formula is provided here. Your uh, uncompressed length should be less than pi d over alpha times this bracket to uh, one half, where clearly you see it's a function of the material, E and G. It's the function of the diameter of the coils and also a function of what we call end conditions. So it depends on how you uh, fix or whether you are not fixing the two ends of the spring. Are the two ends between two fixed surfaces? Is one side allowed to move a little bit or not? So the end conditions, remember, if you remember buckling in solid mechanics, the Euler formula that you had, the Euler formula, right, which is like pi squared E i over uh, kl squared right this is called the critical uh, compression force or you might call it f critical instead of let's say p so i don't want you to think that's pressure this force here it depended on this constant k which was the end conditions so how the two ends of the column are basically uh, conditioned are they fixed are they pivoted are they free and so on so this alpha here plays a similar role to that k and so for example if the spring is supported between flat parallel surfaces which have fixed ends then you see it's what it's half and if both ends are pivoted then it's one if one end is clamped one is two right and then if you have one supported by a flat surface, so it's one end is fixed, one end is flat, then you have a square root 2 over 2, right? And these are basically the same as those numbers that you had for buckling. So you see alpha here plays the same role as K did in buckling. So as long as you make sure that you choose your D and L such that, you choose your D and L such that this inequality is valid, then it's not going to buckle uh, laterally under what? Under uh, the compression. So this is the second criterion that you have to have to make sure that your uh, part is safe and it is what? It is stable. Okay, so, uh, sorry, should be this guy. So that is very important. Now, uh, one other thing I want to mention is, let me talk about this first, the fact that, uh, as I told you, the uh, length of the spring depends on the number of coils or vice versa, so how are they related exactly? Well, it's kind of obvious, right? Which is basically the number of coils times the number of the size of the pitch plus this end conditions really is going to give you the total length. So I just want to show you that relation here in this table. So depending on the end conditions of the spring, uh, the length and the number of coils are related, as I said, and you can see that in this uh, table here. So the ends of the spring could be plain end, which is basically as they are, no trimming, no... Uh, uh, machining is done on them, the, no grinding, and they, 
the helix angle can be seen, right? So you see this end is not really trimmed or anything. Now, one thing I can do is to make sure that one end is squared or closed. Now you can see that clearly this is flat and it can sit against a surface. Or you can basically cut it like this. Right here you see the material is cut. And so we call it uh, basically ground. So this side of it is plain, but this side of it is ground end. Okay? So, uh, and typically one of these two, especially this last one, is used when the spring has to sit against something, right? So, like, this is where the spring is sitting. If this spring is to sit like that, then this bottom portion of it, you have to basically make it flat like this or that, and you cannot just leave it like this, typically. So, for those different conditions, you see that, for example, if it's plain, then the uh, free length, as you can see, is the number of coils times what? Times pitch plus one extra diameter, which you clearly can see why, right? So this is uh, N times P, and then you have one extra diameter of the spool in this region that is added to make the total length or free length P N times D. And then if it's plain and ground, squared or closed, squared and ground, then these uh, formulas available for what? For the length of the spring. Okay. So just wanted to show you this because it is important. And uh, so now if I want to summarize the whole design process, and here we don't consider fatigue, okay? It's very important, and that could be a discussion of its own. If you want to design the spring under fatigue, which is common because many times the springs are loaded and unloaded, then the design is a fatigue design. So here is, we assume that the load is a static, this load F, and it's not changing over time, okay? So the parameters that we have to choose are uh, basically... Uh, the number of coils or length, you might say, and D and D and maybe pitch, right? And um, so you have three, four parameters to choose. And the constraints that you have is one is this safety factor, right, that we define. It has to be in some range, right? So it has to be like between A and B, for example, or equal to some number like uh, not maybe bigger than a right a minimum so that is one criteria that you have the other one is this spring index should be as I said between some number to some other like maybe between 8 to 10 so that you can easily wind the wire and also it's not flimsy so that's the second one that you have the third one that you have is the length should be less than so much, so it is what it is stable against buckling. And so these are three criterion or um, criteria, or you might call constraints for choosing these parameters. And also this pitch itself is limited to, so you don't want the pitch to be super long and big so that uh, these wires are so far away from each other and you don't want it so small that these guys are touching each other right so for example if this p is chosen as two times d what happens these two wires going to be what they're going to be basically uh, tangent to each other and so when they are under compression they're going to press against each other and the spring is going to break so you need to make sure it's bigger than 2d for sure but you don't want it super large and so if I want to add something for that, there is another uh, parameter in uh, springs and in the design of the springs, which is called uh, basically clash allowance. So let me talk about that briefly as well, although I know it makes the video a little bit longer, but that's okay. So uh, if I want to do that, let me move up a little bit some place that I can write. So this clash allowance, which you might call it AC, is the ratio of XS minus XW divided by XW. 
and the value that you typically choose for this is about 0.2 or 20 percent now what is xs what is xw so xw here is basically the deflection of the spring in working condition right so let me write it for you so this is what this is the spring deflection under working conditions and this x of s is basically the uh, uncompressed length minus what we call solid length what is solid length solid length is when the spring is compressed such that the wires are touching so this is we call it the solid length and again this is what this is when it becomes like a solid all these gaps are going to be taken away okay so i guess i have it in this table if we go down in this table that i just showed you that was about the length and everything here you can see that right look it's called solid length and you can see in solid length the pitch has no role okay while in free length it does so the pitch ultimately will show itself in uh, this uh, we call the um, clash allowance and if we choose a number or a range for clash allowance then based on that we decide how much this pitch is going to be because pitch determines l naught and ls is a uh, not depending on piece but the whole xs does and for working condition we have to assume or find something through simulations and then from here we can uh, also decide on how much of p is a good p okay as i said we don't want during the working condition for these uh, sp uh, spring wires these coils to touch each other we don't want it to go to the ls ever and we don't want a ton of gap because a ton of gap makes L not bigger. And when L not is bigger, it means what? It means you have a better chance of buckling. So you have to choose what? A reasonable number for uh, the parameter P or pitch. Okay, so you have four parameters and you have four conditions, equality or inequalities, in general inequalities. And clearly design is what? A trial and error uh, to get all the conditions satisfied. Now, it doesn't mean that you indefinitely keep for trial and error, but you can do some optimization to get the best results. But typically, it's not just one, cycle, one uh, try. It's typically a cycle. Okay, the last thing I want to say is, what is the spring constant? So if you have a spring... Remember, the force of the spring is what? That's what we learned in physics. The spring force is equal to its constant times its deflection, right? So it is what? Uh, it is K, the constant that we learned. Let me use this. It is some constant times the deflection of it, like that. Delta L, right? Or here you called it X. So the question is, this k the spring constant how can we find it for a compression spring with known geometry and material for that we're going to use the castiglianos theorem that is in solid mechanics so we find the strain energy this is the strain energy due to torsion this is the strain energy of the shear and for t g for t j L, L here is the total length. This L is like the total length, L. And A, we're going to replace our what? Our uh, formulas that we have. We know what A is. We know what J is. We know T is FD over 2. And the total length is, of course, what? Is pi D over N. Remember, D is the diameter. Pi D is like one circumference. And if you have N coils, right, since this helix,
one revolution of that is pi d and if you have n revolutions then the total length is what pi d times n right this is the total length of the helix so if you plug in this is the total energy of what the total strain energy of the spring now based on the cassie -Giliano, gilianos theorem if we find the derivative of this energy with respect to what with respect to the compression force that gives you the amount of deflection. So basically this delta Y and L and this Y are the same thing here. So if I do that, then you can find this is going to be what? This is going to be your deflection. And remember from here that deflection is always what? Is the spring force or the force, whatever it is, divided by K. So now compare these two sides, compare that guy and this one. If you get rid of what? If you get rid of F, from here, by taking reciprocal of both sides, you can find K, and you'll see that the spring constant for what? For a compression spring is this guy here, D to the 4 or times G over 8 D cubed over N. And everything does make sense. If the material is stronger, if the shear modulus is bigger, G, the spring constant is bigger. If the thickness of the spool is bigger, right, clearly to a power of 4k is going to be bigger. So this one tell, tells you something very interesting, right? If you make the wire like two times what? Thicker, that means the spring constant is going to be 16 times bigger, right? You clearly see that. And, of course, you don't want the number of coils to be long because that's going to make the spring flimsy and deflecting easily and buckling. And, of course, the uh, diameter, the average diameter of the coils should not be big. And you see, again, it's proportional to inverse of D to the 3. So if you make your spring 2 times wider, the D 2 times bigger, you are making the spring 8 times weaker, or the constant of it 8 times smaller. Okay, so these powers are what? Very interesting. So this is what? This is the spring constant for a compression spring. Okay, I guess I told you how to go about designing a, a spring, what are the parameters that are involved, and basically how to find the spring constant and how to make sure it doesn't buckle. So hopefully this video was useful to you, and I'll see you in my next lecture. Thank you so much.